All right, in conjunction with the Gardner Waterman chapter of Sabre, chaired by Dr. Clayton Trudor, I want to welcome everyone to this week's virtual meeting of the Northern New England chapter of Sabre. I'm Bruce McClure, the chapter chair here in New Hampshire and Maine, and we have a really, really great guest for everyone this week. Bob Busser's father once said, that's a quirky little hobby. Now, 900 sporting venues and 75,000 images later, Bob's 40-year hobby has made him one of the preeminent ballpark photographers and historians in the country. Bob's award-winning work has been featured in various magazines and publications over the years, but is prominently shown at the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown in the Sacred Grounds Permanent Exhibit. Since 2007, Bob's website has displayed his photographs to many fans, garnering over 45 million hits. And if that's not enough, his Facebook page, Ballparks, Stadiums, and Arenas of the Past and Present, is one of the most popular sports-themed pages on social media today. Oh, and by the way, he's also been called the Casper David Friedrich of sports photography. Bob Busser, welcome to Northern New England. How are you? I can't get my head through the door right now, man. I'm, I'm swimming. <laughs> Thank you for the nice words. And hello, everybody. It's nice to be with you from uh, actually sunny Northern California right now. <laughs> you know what? I just gave you a big old introduction, and then you've got to come up, come at us and say, oh, it's sunny here in California. Well, we're in total darkness. Come on, man. No snow yet. So, um, you know, we, we don't get snow where I live in Fairfield, but uh, Tahoe and Mammoth are getting snow. And I know you guys fall is, is uh, coming through and, uh, you know, it's it's uh, football weather, you know, going to the games with sweatshirts on and your pom poms and whatever, um, even though baseball season, alas, has just ended. Um, you know, hopefully the Red Sox will do better next year. Well, we'll see what Craig Breslow can put together for the Red Sox, but let's talk about you. You've been at this as a sports photographer, uh, taking pictures of stadiums, arenas, and, and such all around the country for over 40 years. Tell us how you got started in photography. I read a little bit about this story that I thought it was great. Well, uh, it, honestly, it started when I was probably seven or eight years old, and I was one of the kid, kids today won't know what I'm talking about, one of the transistor radio kids uh, growing up in Southern California. I would go to sleep with a little transistor radio under my pillow and listen to Vince Gully. Vinny, in his own way, would describe Crosley Field, Ebbets Field, in such detail, and my eyes were like this. It, it just clicked. And uh, I... I, I in my in a youth, I wanted to see all these places. A lot of them were long gone when I started. Um, but I remember my first game was in uh, 1967 at Dodger Stadium. It was May. They were playing the Mets. Claude Osteen threw a five hitter, one two to nothing. And I've got a couple of photos that I took. So I guess uh, I was all of nine years old when it started in 1968 or 67. Um, maybe I think it was eight. Uh, and uh, it's gone from there. I took photo classes in school. And, you know, it's great. I, I've done everything and there is in photography. I've done products and, you know, uh, uh, shooting uh, architecture and portraits and weddings and all this stuff. But this this takes the cake because it brings back um, memories of of plays and players that have played on these fields. Um, you know, even if it's in a place I've never been, like um, I'll just use, for example, I've been there. But if you walk on the Notre Dame Stadium, you know, I mean, come on, the ghosts are there. And even uh, in 19 uh, or in 20, 2002, uh, my wife, I took her to Yankee Stadium for the first time. And my wife, Noreen, is one of the biggest baseball fans there is. And she walked in and she's a Red Sox fan like her husband. But she said, my God, Babe Ruth played here. Lou Gehrig played right down there. Mickey Mantle played right there. And she was in awe, you know, and that's why I do this, because it doesn't matter where it is. It could be, you know, a Potter County Stadium in Amarillo, Texas, some podunk old broken down ballpark, but people have an affection for it. And I try to take as many photos as I can. And thank God for digital, because I'd be bankrupt now if I still had to use film. And um, 
it, it's just gone on from there. It's it just, it, it's like one of those things, uh, you know, you're eating M&Ms and you can't stop, you know, they, you know, one after the other, you know, it's like, I got to go see this one. I got to go see this one. And that's what I do. And I, I love every bit of it. And I've made a lot of friends in the industry. And um, most of them are glad to see me when I show up with my camera. That's that. That's just fantastic. Now, what 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 was the the first stadium that you put on film as a professional? Now you've uh, gone through all of this with your with your 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 schooling and whatnot. Now you're out in the world trying to make a buck. What was the first professional arena shoot you had? Probably Fenway Park. One one of my trips back to Boston, it had because I've shot Fenway Park almost more than every time I go to Fenway, even though I've shot it 20 times, I still bring my camera because I see something different. And it's gone on from there, you know, and one of my favorite places to shoot was Old Tiger Stadium in Detroit. Um, I was one of the last photographers in through the Hall of Fame uh, before they tore it down and it it made me sad because it was a mess. I walked into the, the uh, through the water into the Tigers clubhouse and it was a disaster. The ceiling was caving in. It was, it was, you know, it was falling apart, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, Ty Cobb stood on this field, you know, and, you know, uh, Al Kaline, Hank Greenberg, Mickey Lolich, you know, the, the 68 Tigers, uh, bless you boys, the whole bit, you know, and it just runs through my mind. It doesn't matter where it is. I, I, I do my research and find out who played there and I can picture these guys playing on the field. You know, it's, it's almost like I, I, I uh, liken it to the, the opening scene in Pat or the scene in Patton where he's looking at the battlefield and he sees it in his mind and the music is playing and, and it's, it's kind of weird, but it, it works for me. And, and it's, and it's true. It's, it's uh, like a second vision almost. And it's, it's fascinating what I, I can come up with. I've always been fascinated by the photographers that wandered around uh, ballparks, especially when I was working minor league baseball, I worked in on uh, Britain, Connecticut, for the older Britain Rockcats for an awfully long time and got to see a lot of amateur, for lack of better, photographers at work. Um, nobody really like you who pursued this hobby for as long as you have. It's interesting to see the difference between like my father-in-law, who is a photographer who just shoots like me for a, a headshot for, you know, my professional work and what you do. Now you've done this so long, you've photographed probably every arena in the country. Pretty close to it. What's that? Pretty close to it. <laughs> I'm sure you've got some stories about some things you've seen, some things you've experienced, some things that happened. The first one that comes to mind is the first media pass I ever had in uh, 1977. I was 18, um, green eyed, and, and I BS my way into a media pass, which so, you know, doing what you do, sometimes you have to do it. But um, I got a media pass from the Angels, and they were playing the Red Sox. 3.30 for a 7.30 game. I'm walking on the field scared to death. I mean, Yastrzemski's on the field. Dwight Evans, Pudge Fisk, all my heroes are on the field. And I'm standing there with my camera, and the first guy that comes up to me is Fergie Jenkins. Fergie goes, hey, you got a camera, blah, blah, blah. We start talking. And to this day, I'm still friends with Fergie. He's one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. And, you know... Fergie and I go way back. So I'm sitting there and taking the photos. He introduces me, takes me a picture of me with Yaz. And I'm talking to Bernie Carbo and everything. And I'm having a great, I'm, I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store. So um, before the game, I'm getting ready to go up into the stands to sit down. And uh, Fergie and Jim Rice get me and they go, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to go sit in the stands and watch the game. And he said, no, you're, you're going to sit in the dugout with us. As God is my witness, this happened. So I'm thinking, holy <laughs> Um, so I'm sitting in the dugout and, and, uh, um, Fergie's, Fergie wasn't pitching that night. He was charting for the next night. And, uh, every time he had the movie, he'd go boomer, George Scott, go sit next to Bobby. We don't want Popeye to see him. So, I mean, I'm watching the whole game in the dugout and I'm sitting there and, uh, Dwight Evans strikes out on a high fastball. 
um, from Derwood Merrill. I remember it like it was yesterday. He comes walking back, slams his helmet into the into the the uh, holder and the bat rack and everything. Sits down next to me and he goes, "That burns my bleeping ass." And I don't know why I said this, and this is the honest to God's truth. I sat there and I said, do you get him next time? Son of a bitch, if he does not hit a home run the next time. I kid you not. He makes a beeline for me to give me a high five. It's a true story. And Fergie's laughing, you know. So I'm getting ready to leave. And, um, you know, uh, Rice comes up to me and he goes, are you coming tomorrow night? He goes, you're our good luck charm. And I said, can you get me? I said, can you get me tickets? He got me tickets for 10 years. And, he, you know, I pick him up, take him to the ballpark. You know, we go to lunch or whatever. And, you know, I, I was like their little brother for a little bit. And, you know, for an 18-year-old in California to have my favorite team, you know, I'm kind of like their their little brother. It was, it's, I'll never, ever forget it. It was one of the greatest, outside of getting married, it was probably the one of the greatest days of my life. I mean, I, I was with my heroes and they all treated me like I was, I wasn't just somebody. You know, I was, I was a, a kid because Fergie took the time to introduce me and explain who I was and yeah, I know Yaz is aloof. I get that. He's he's very shy. And he was he's every time I met Yaz, he's been very nice to me. So and uh the the upshot to this story was fast forward to 1994. I'm at the Astrodome in Houston and they're playing the Rockies. And Dewey is the hitting coach, Dwight Evans is hitting coach. And I went up to him and I tapped him on the shoulder and said, Hey Dewey, and he looks at me and he goes, you had a blue Trans Am in Southern California, didn't you? And I'm like, son of a, how are you doing? He goes, how are you, man? You know, it was like old home week, you know, but that's the kind of connections, you know, if you're not going to stab these guys, but that's the kind of connections you make. If you treat them right, they're going to treat you right. You know, if you act like a jerk around them, then all bets are off. So I've, I've learned, you know, even if it's dealing with musicians or whoever, you treat them like they're regular people and you're going to be fine. You know, and they 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 appreciate that because they get all the crap all all the time, the autographs and and all the BS stories and everything. But you know, um, it, it's just it's just it's part of the experience of growing up, I guess. You know, I learned early. <laughs> I learned early. <laughs> well, you used an interesting word there just a second ago, and 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 I I already know I'm gonna have I'm I'm not gonna be able to click the save for kids button when I upload this to YouTube. So, but that's okay. That's all right. I'm good with that. <laughs> you used an interesting word just a minute ago. You used the word connection, and I tried to um, support that word, so to speak through social media and baseball since really getting involved with Sabre in the membership ambassador program and such. Talk to us for a minute about the connections you've made throughout the years through that camera lens, whether it be on the field, off the field, whatever it might be, because to me, at least watching photographers in, in the ballparks that I worked in, I noticed that they had an easier time making those connections for whatever reason. Can you speak to that? Yeah, because um, uh, the Z man out here in Oakland, he shot the 49ers for, I mean, he's older than Methuselah and he's still shooting for the A's and the Niners, uh, uh, Zagaris. And um, he knows everybody. And, and it's, it's like, if they trust you with a connection and they know you're not going to stab him in the back, they're fine with you. But, you know, and, and through Fergie and through my lens, um, I just, the ballpark, my ballpark website has opened so many doors. Like um, one of my good buddies now is one of the SIDs at Dartmouth and the other one is at Cornell. And Jeremy Hardigan, I called him like five or six years ago, told him I want to come photograph the facility. He said, come on down. He spent three hours with me going through the facility. He goes, Bob, anytime you're in town, let me know you got whatever you want we got it for you it's because i don't i don't overstep my boundaries and i treat the place with respect that's all you got to do and it's 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 basically what i tell people life is all about life is common sense if you use common sense and you're kind to people life is fairly easy we make it complicated with all the crap that's going on but if you treat people right and they know you're doing a good job and you're helping them out 
they'll give you carte blanche. Um, Jeremy called me a while back. He goes, Bob, I, I, I need an assistant SID. And he goes, I thought of you, but I can't afford you. <laughs> Just like that. He goes, but I can get you gigs, you know, uh, you know, we can freelance you here, but I can't afford you as an SID assistant. So, you know, it, it, it just, it's, it's just um, stuff that, uh, you know, over the years, the, the connections you make, you might not see these people for five years, but um, they know who you are and you know who they are. They say, hi, how are you doing? It's like, you know, what goes on? SID is sports information director, if I remember yes. correctly, right? Yep. Yes. Sorry, I just said that. That's okay. That's okay. But, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a uh, it's you know it's a very small uh, community that we're in, um, and everybody knows everybody else. You may not know them personally, but you know who they are, and you know you make connections that way. And my twenty-year-old uh, nephew Evan is going to Sacramento State here, and he's doing the Sacramento State Hornets podcasts for sports. So he's following somewhat in his uncle's footsteps, and uh, he's doing great. And I told that's the first thing I told him. I said. Make sure when you meet people, shake their hand, say their name, remember their name. If they're a jerk, just be nice and just walk away. Don't say anything because you may run into them again. You never know. Just don't burn your bridges. Um, you know, I've done it once or twice, but uh, that was for different reasons. Um, that was for real estate agents who didn't want to pay me. Anyway, <laughs> you know, oh, oh, uh, oh, real oh. estate agents were notorious for wanting everything for nothing. And I don't do that anymore. Um but you know, it, it it you you treat people the way you want to be treated, and most of the time it works out. You know, it might not seem like it, but it, it truly, truly does, especially in sports, you know. Um, especially mostly mostly in college and, and as you know, the minor leagues, because they're they're open for almost anything. Major leagues, you're getting a little more mm, I don't want to say uppity, but you're getting a little more uh, you know, um I don't I don't know the word I'm looking for, but uh, the minors in, in college is so much fun. You know, because I love seeing the kids play. It, it, you see the joy in their faces. They haven't been really poisoned yet by the money. And I think that's part of the problem. Uh, a lot of the bigger players, you know, it's all about the money. And they kind of lose sight of the fact that, um, you know, the fans are paying their bills and, you know, supporting them. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a catch-22 sometimes, you know. Um, people have bad days. We all have bad days. Um, even photographers, believe it or not. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, you just have to take the good with the bad. Sometimes if a guy doesn't want to talk or have a picture taken, you respect that and you walk away. You, you don't want to force the issue because you don't want to be known as that guy or that girl, that lady or whatever. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, Jean Fruth is a good friend of mine. She's a photographer, uh, who's done a lot of work with the hall of fame and her and uh, Jeff Idelson, who is the former president, um, she does a lot of major league photos and her photos are great. And she says the same thing, you know, you meet a lot of people, you know, Hey, it's great to see you. And you share ideas and, you know, you have that camaraderie. And Jean was the one that told me, she said, you know, Bob, there's more credit, less accredited photographers in the hall of fame with photos on display than there are athletes. And I thought about that and Jeff kind of shook his head and I went, that's kind of cool. You know, you can't take that away from me. That's my, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I <laughs> uh, wanted to let everyone know that if you go down to the bottom, to the toolbar down there, you will see the button that's marked reactions. When you click that, another button comes up that says raise hand. If you have a question or a comment that you would like to make here tonight to have a discussion with Bob Busser, one of the great photographers in our uh, sport today, please do so. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the reason I started that is because we have a hand up uh molly and the um other guest of honor this evening everybody loves gus gus is the the, the mascot of our chapter gus the saber cat is here um molly you can unmute yourself and off you go hi bob thanks for coming to talk to us first of all um I was wondering what you found to be the most challenging um, stadium to shoot. Um, my dad and mom are both renowned photographers in the local area here, and they've had some interesting challenges over time, and they find them to be the most satisfying. And I was wondering what your most challenging shoot was, and did you find it ultimately most satisfying? When I first started doing this, and thanks for your question. I love your cat in the background. He, he looks like he's uh, snoozing through the interview here. 
um, the, it's uh, when I first started shooting Wrigley Field in Chicago, the lighting was weird. Uh, for whatever reason, the lighting was weird. And I was using film back then, but that was that was challenging. And some of the arenas um, that I would shoot, one that comes to mind, uh, it took me forever to get into was the old Chicago International Amphitheater, um, which was, I mean, it, if you look up the word dump, this was a dump. And it was dark inside and I was using film back then because I wasn't, this was 94. And I was literally shooting open exposure. I didn't have my tripod with me like an idiot on the on the some of the railings and the photos came out great. And I'm thinking these aren't going to come out. And they came out great. It was a challenge. And then when I started shooting digital, I realized I could up my speeds and shoot in almost total darkness, like um, some of the uh, college basketball arenas I shot and the photos come out like it's day. And I'm just like, thank you. You know, it, it, it uh, the older stadiums were a challenge because of the lighting. The lighting isn't wasn't good back in the 80s, in the 90s, like it is now, because they all have LED lighting. And especially Madison Square Garden, because um, everything came out orange because of the tungsten lighting they had, or, or I think it was tungsten. But, and I didn't know it at the time. You don't really know it until you're shooting. And, and I didn't know any photographers in New York. And uh, so I had to go in Photoshop and really work at it to make them halfway decent. But uh, that was a challenge was the lighting. And once you figure it out it and you can get it right, you're like, oh, yeah, that, that's really cool. But lighting in some of the older buildings is the hardest. What did, you, what did your parents say about it? They say it's pretty much the same thing. Um. My parents um, definitely talk a lot about lighting and they have recently had several gallery openings and showings for a lot of nature photography. Awesome. Um, and they have Photoshop and I think they use something called Lightbox as well. Yeah. And yeah. Um, they really are able to tweak a lot of it. And um I've gone with them on a couple shoots and I'm always the backup just in case um, they have a wedding and one of them gets sick or something happens. Um, I did a lot of photography when I was young and I was in my dance classes on the weekends and dad taught me how to shoot as weird as it sounds. He taught me to shoot in black and white oh, yeah. at the graveyard across the street from my dance school. Because his thought was, if I can shoot in shades of gray and get it clear on film, you can do anything else. Bingo. And um, I have a nice little camera, a little Canon digital. And when Bruce and I went down to the Sabre convention, um, I was working with... Um, Randy. Yeah, I was working with Jacob and I was able to upload all the photos I took with my camera to the Sabre site of the convention. So, you know, I'm not necessarily at dad's level and mom's level, but I enjoy it and I play with it. And, you know, every Christmas Gus gets his photo shoot <laughs> under the Christmas tree. <laughs> that's, that's half of it. If you enjoy what you're doing in photography, You've won the battle. I am more at home with my cameras, you know, as my wife will attest. When we go on a, a trip, first thing I pack is my cameras and make sure the batteries are charged, everything's ready to go. The, you know, the, the cars are all clean and nothing's on them. And, and you know, um, we were in New England in um, 2018 for my 60th birthday, an early birthday present. Of course, we went to Fenway and we were up in Maine and Vermont and seeing all the fall colors and everything because my birthday's in October. Um, and um, I shot oh, geez, almost 15,000 photos in three weeks. 15,000. That's a lot. Yeah. My fingers got tired. <laughs> My <laughs> parents. <laughs> so when they became grandparents, um, every holiday in the fall, you know, at the hospital when the babies were born, they would take photos. And... Honey, when did we do that photo shoot with Ian in the tree at Munster Farm, Munster Field Farm? A couple that was, years. That ago? was probably a couple of years ago. There's a lot of good fall color there. Yeah, a lot of good fall colors, and we were able to get 
Ian up in the tree between us standing. And it was between the few different places my parents took us in the area. It was around 200 photos. Wow. And dad will take Ian to the beach because we live in the lakes region of New Hampshire. So we literally have a beach. Like if you were able to go st straight through my parents' property and down the hill, there's a beach at the bottom of the hill because <laughs> my parents live across the street from us. Um, my dad will go to the beach with Ian sometimes and take his telephoto lens and shoot him jumping off the docks. And we have these incredible pictures of him in midair, like cannonballing. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of pride with the fact of now being grandparents because there's a lot of, you know, like two Mother's Day ago, Ian decided he wanted to do tractor races across the two yards because between the two yards, we have about three acres of land. And I was on the tractor and he was on his bike and we were racing like we made an obstacle course between the yards and dad got all these pictures of the two of us on the tractor and bikes. I have a, a series of photos on my website. It's called uh, the road to the left. And basically that's my theme to life is don't be a follower. Take the road to the left. You never know what you'll find. I, I lived by that my whole life. And usually it's, it's uh, in the mountains of the Sierras out here in the West or the new England coast where a lot of people don't get to. And I shoot my nature and scenery photos and people just go, Oh my God, where is this? And it's, it's so much fun for me to take me out of my realm of uh, shooting stadiums to do this because it, it, it kind of really relaxes me. And yeah. You know, this country, there's so much to shoot in this country. Uh, but, you know, we have the monuments, which is great. You know, you've got uh, the Washington Monument, Statue of Liberty, all that stuff. Fantastic. It's awesome. But there's other stuff to shoot, too. And that's what I like to do. And it can be a mundane cabin in the middle of nowhere. Oh, yeah, those are great. That was my birthday present a couple of years ago from my parents. Wow. Those are great. That's a metal print set. Those are beautiful. And that was off the side of the highway that's not too far from us. Wow. Everybody here is getting a, uh, a view into New Hampshire uh, life with uh, tractor obstacle races, stopping by the side of the road to take pictures of lost, of, of, of nature. And, and, and yeah, we're, you, uh, there is no truth to the rumor that when you move into this town, you get a banjo as a uh, as a complimentary gift. We have uh, other photographers here this evening who will be um, presenting to us as we go forward. I just want to say hi to Donna Muscarella, the lens of Donna, who will be um, presenting to us next week. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but I also want to flip to Susan Nelson, who is next up on the list. Susan, you're up. Hi. Uh, really interesting about the photography. I know that guy from Oakland, Michael. Oh, yes. Uh, I used to be a season ticket holder back from 77 to, through 2004. Uh -huh. And, and I, I, you know, he he was always there. I had new people that knew him. Um, and I, I was catching an A's game this year, and there he was, the same <laughs> guy. I can't believe he's still there. And it's been like 18 years since I lived in the Bay Area, so... Anyway, uh, my question is, um, how do you organize and categorize and store all your images? And um, are they are they for sale or, or do you own the rights to all of them or have you yes. sold them to people or how does that um, work? People have used them. Um, one of my later, uh, one of my earlier photos from Old Schaefer Stadium where the past used to play. Um, they're doing a documentary and I got, I get emails, uh, I got an email from one of their, their finders, you know, who, uh, Hey, we want to use your photo as part of this 10 part documentary on the Patriots championship years. And I'm like, okay, they sent me the check without batting an eye. They use the photo and we're still in contact. I'm kind of like a liaison, you know, they ask me questions and, and, um, you know, I'm, the, I'm the stadium guy. So, you know, uh, I do sell my photos um people can email me and i will sell them i sell the negative the uh the jpeg images um and then if they buy a regular print photo that's from film off my website uh, i'll send them that um but uh you know that way they can they can print it up in any size they want and um you know it's 
it's it saves me a lot of pain and and going to you know wherever to get them printed and mailed out and all that other stuff and it's worked out really well but uh we call the z-man we we call him the keith richards of uh photographers because he's like keith he's never going to go anywhere you know he just i think they just prop him up and put z out there at the beginning of every year and he and mickey Mir morabito i think is mickey still around yeah i think he's still maybe? around with the bad hair, yeah, Mickey's still and he's around. been around since the Billy Martin days, which is oh hard, yeah, yeah, hard I, to I, I, the bad yeah, Mickey. Hair. Yeah, the last time I saw Mickey was uh, the night of the OJ uh, um, uh, car chase, and I'm sitting in the press box at Arlington Stadium, and we're watching. Nobody's watching the game, and they were playing the A's. And nobody's watching the game, but I'm kind of giving commentary because they knew I was from California. And I said, yeah, they're going up to 405 by LAX and da-da-da-da-da. And they're looking at me, and we're watching the, the chase, and the game is going. Nobody is watching the game. They're watching this stupid car chase. But Mickey was there. But, yeah, and, uh, you know, so we, we talked for a little bit. And, um, you know, um, one of my friends is retiring from the Baseball Hall of Fame, uh, John Horn, and he's coming out here to the West Coast and um, – uh, he's getting us all together, you know, for one big, uh, you know, farewell because he's in the photo uh, archive department and I've known John forever and we're all going to get together. Uh, Z-Man's going to be there. Um, some of the other people that I know are going to be there. Um, um, Jeff Idelson and and I think uh, his his girlfriend are going to be there, Gene Fruth. So, you know, it's it, again, like I was telling earlier, it's it, it's the the people that we know you're in that small inner circle and and you know you, you can you can tease with them and kid with them and everything and and it, it's great so i'm really looking forward to seeing these guys next year oh you know it's funny you just mentioned the oj chase in baseball because that night i can tell you exactly where i was i was in the in old beehive field in the Britain, Connecticut. You photographed this yes, it's before on, it's and on after it, it was a, a minor league ballpark. And I'm sitting there watching the game and there's this woman sitting next to me and she is she is motionless. She's got a headset on and she's motionless. She's, not, she's a statue. And at some innocuous point in the game, it may even have been between half innings, she blurts out at the top of her lungs, Oh my God. And, you know, this speaks to connection and whatnot. From, you know, and I turn and do this, and she looks at me and says, They can't find OJ. <laughs> what? I got home to see him pull it in the, in, in the driveway. It was nuts. Oh, it was crazy. I'm, I'm sitting in the press box and and the game's going on and no, I swear to God, nobody's watching the game. The writers are all watching. Right? He had the screens and they flipped it onto the, the uh, local channels, whatever it was in, in Dallas. And we're sitting there watching it and I'm going, yeah, there's, there's the exit to LAX. He's coming up to 405. He's coming into uh, um, West LA and Santa Monica. And they're looking at me and they go, how the hell do you know that? And I said, I was born and raised in Southern California and everybody knows the 405 freeway. So, um, you know, it was kind of cool. It was kind of a surreal situation situation it because my wife was flying back to dallas to drive back home with me um because i was on a couple week road trip or she was my girlfriend at the time and she didn't see it and i told her what was going on and we were watching it in the hotel after the game and everything but uh it was a it was one of the weirdest nights i've ever spent in a ballpark you know because i mean this this newsworthy event is going on and boom <laughs> you know <laughs> I want to go to noted author and Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame inductee Donna Hal and and, and oh, look at her post. That was pretty awesome. I wish we could have got that. Uh, Donna Halper is here this evening. Donna, I am honored to have you in tonight. How are you? Well, thank you. I'm uh, doing okay for uh, a woman of my age, I suppose. But uh, twenty-seven, right? Hey, thirty-nine. Come on. Uh, go for still it. young and cute um and bobby and i go back a long way so um <laughs> let's be careful donna we could get in trouble here <laughs> no, no. should um, i stop recording i have no, no, i have good. several things i want to talk about but first of all i want to say thank you because i'm a media historian as many of you know and I couldn't do my work 
if it weren't for great photographers, okay? There are so many great photographers of the game. Because of them, the game lives on. I mean, yes, I work with words. I'm, you know, I write books, I write articles. But for obvious reasons, I wasn't at the games in 1920 or 1930 or whatever. And being able to look in a newspaper or a magazine and see some of those images, it, it's just amazing to me. And in the modern era, people like you, Bob, you're keeping the game alive for the next generation. You're keeping the ballparks alive for the next generation. And I applaud what you're doing. I, I One of the things I'm a little sad about is that with the new technology, we have so many people thinking like, oh, anybody can do that. And it's like, nah, not anybody can do that. No, 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 no. So thank you for your artist artistic talent, your artistry, all of these good things. So I just wanted to put that out there. Now, Here's my question. I'm a big fan, as you know, of the Negro Leagues. Yes. And I feel like so much has not been preserved and it breaks my heart. Have you been to any of the ballparks where Negro League baseball played? I know that so many of them no longer exist, but there are some parks where Negro League teams were. Yes. Were you able to get your hands on any of that history? And yes. if so, how was that for you? Because I, I know I had the privilege of being in a couple of places and it was like, I can't believe I'm here, if that makes any sense. Well, you, as you know, Getty Lee, uh, the basis for Rush, is a big Negro League fan. Absolutely. And he's donated a lot of his stuff to the Negro League Museum. And Ged is a, is a great guy and a, a big baseball fan. Yeah, I'm going to um, see him next week. I'll send him your regards. Tell Ged I said hi. And um, um, the Indianapolis Clowns used to play at um, um, Bush Stadium, um, which is now, believe it or not, they have turned Bush Stadium, the old minor league ballpark for the Indianapolis Indians and the Clowns, they turned it into apartments. So you can literally live at the ballpark. And I was just there in May, and it's fantastic. And uh, the first time I shot it was, geez, probably 30 years ago, and they still played there. And it was at sunset, and some of the there's some of my favorite photos because the sun is setting, and it's behind the first base, and you can just picture Hank Aaron played on that team. Hank Aaron played there. A lot of the Negro League players played at that place. They also played at Old Municipal Stadium in Kansas City, which when I saw it, it was a vacant lot. The stadium was torn down. And there's a marker there that Municipal Stadium was there. Now there's houses on the site. But there's so many ballparks um, that, um, you know, Hinkliffe Stadium in New Jersey, which I really want to get to, you know, they all tell a story. You know, and we need to preserve these places because, like you said, they played at Comiskey Park in Chicago, and I was lucky enough to get in before they tore it down. Um, they played at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, the old Pittsburgh Crawfords, um, and the Homestead Grays. So, you know, all those ballparks tell a story. Even if it's vacant ground now, you can almost picture Josh Gibson playing for the Pittsburgh Crawfords, you know, or Satchel Page pitching for the Kansas City Monarchs with Buck O'Neill and all these guys. Uh, it, you you need to let your mind really engulf where you are and take in everything because your mind is a wonderful thing. Um, and and you're, you can really you can really feel the history there. Oh, There's yeah. one Some of the players by. played in places where maybe they weren't necessarily like New England had this really good semi-pro series of clubs where the players played all over the place. They played in Portsmouth. They played in, you know, up in Maine. They played, you name it, they were there. And sometimes I just think to myself, somebody needs to do an exhibit, a, a photographic exhibit of all the different places where Black players played in that era, in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. I think it would just expand people's understanding because not just, every area of the country had enough of a black population to have right. a Negro Leagues team but Especially like I'm working on a saber bio for Cannonball Jackman and he played in Portsmouth Portsmouth New Hampshire for a 
couple of years. And he also played in Maine and he, you know, he was in Massachusetts and every place he went, people were like, oh my God, he's better than Satchel Paige. And just like running into the parks where he was, some of those parks are still around. And you know, went... you, you've given me, you always give me an idea, Donna, when you and I talk. So um, more than I'm just gonna... another pretty face, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're still 27 to me, Donna. Don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and get a hold of the Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City and see if I can talk to Bob Kendrick and see if we can put something together because I think that would be fascinating too. You know, uh, I um, it, it's hard to find lists of where they played. I know the Negro Leagues has an extensive list of, of every the, in their archives. I know um, somebody who knows some of the places where they played. <laughs> there you go. You're gonna you're, you're gonna get a phone call. You're gonna get a. We're gonna zoom. We'll zoom later this week, maybe Don, and we'll talk about it. Hey, I'm so. about to have time on my hands. My university's trying to fire me. I know. Um, no, yeah, for real. They're they, they just like thirty of us. They just laid off thirty of us, of wow. whom eighty percent are over fifty. Okay, wow. so. Uh, I'm fighting it, but we'll see what God provides. Meanwhile, if I got time on my hands, I'll be happy to uh, help you with your research. Let's, anyway, let's... thank you for all you do, Bobby, and whatever we can do to preserve more about the Negro Leagues, I think we would be doing a kindness. Thanks, Don. Along those good. lines, I want to jump in for just a second because we have another person on the on the call this evening that can speak a little bit to that, if you don't mind, Bob. I just want to have Donna Muscarella jump in for a second here on uh, Hincliffe in Jersey. Donna, can you give us just a, just a little bit on uh, that ballpark? Sure. It'll, it'll be a good uh, preview for what you guys can uh, see next week if you, if you tune back in, because I'll be presenting on Hinchliffe. Um, next week. So the ballpark is one of the few Negro Leagues ballparks that is still standing. Um, I live about 11 miles away from it and very sadly didn't know of its existence until um, 2020. So that tells you uh, that, you know, like, like Donna Helper said, we need to preserve this history and, and we need to, to let people know about it. Um, so the ballpark was in a horrible, horrible state of disrepair. Um, amazingly, in early 2021, they announced that millions of dollars was found um, to restore the place. And it is now open as a um, multi-use venue again with a professional ballpark, a professional baseball team um, playing there, the New Jersey Jackals of the MLB affiliated um, Frontier League. And they also play football, soccer. They've had wrestling, boxing, cricket, um, all sorts of stuff. But the first time I went there, and I'm not going to give away everything because there's a lot more to it that I'll talk about next week. Um, but the first time I walked it up, I just had goosebumps on goosebumps because I'm saying, oh my gosh, the people who played here, who walked through, you know, through these, these gates, who played on that field. It's just, the list is, is crazy. Tune in next week if you want to know more. You, you, you are my sister from another mother. I mean, I, I felt the same way. The first time I walked into Fenway Park, I was a rosy cheek 17 year old just out of high school in July of 76. And I'm, I won't use the words I use, but I'm an ex catcher. So I'm allowed to use the F bomb now and then. But, um, you know, I'm like, I can't effing believe I'm here. I mean, I was the, your eyes get this big and you're like you're like yep. the proverbial little kid in the candy store mm -hmm. you're like oh my god yeah ted williams was here you know babe ruth actually played here and you know it runs through your mind my god all the great things that happened here and of course uh it was right in 76 it was right after fisk hit the home run and the red sox won the world series three games to four in my eyes but um you know it it, it, it brings like you said you walk in and you're like wow i can't believe i'm here I, I, every time I walk into a place, uh, whether it's a college football stadium or, or their arena, I see the same thing. Because, you know, I uh, um, I photographed the arena at uh, UMass where uh, 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 the cage where uh, Dr. J played. And I, I'm like, oh, cage. that's it. That's it. And I'm thinking Dr. J played in here. You know, I mean, and one of the greatest basketball players ever, you know, and it's still in use. It's not a 
they they play one game every once in a great while in there, but it's used, you know, like any college, um, their old arenas are multi-use um, facilities now, whether it's for, you know, volleyball or wrestling or whatever. But, you know, I agree with her, you know, you get goosebumps walking into these places. It's, it's absolutely mind boggling to, to think about I mean, just the, the history, but also how few people know the history. And that's why Absolutely. I'm just so passionate about this because people need to know. Abs that's why you hit it right. That's why I do this. We need to preserve these places because like Donna said, a lot of the places are gone. You know, even in Major League Baseball or Minor League Baseball, a lot of Minor League ballparks are gone. You know, the old, really old ones, you know, like uh, Big Mac, MacArthur Stadium in Syracuse and, um, you know, Silver Stadium in Rochester. They're gone. They're parking lots now, um, you know, but but it, they have a history. And fortunately, I, I not I'm, only that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but not oh. only are they gone, but even some of the local people don't know they were ever there. Exactly. Like I call librarians and say, hey, you know, I want to know more about the stadium where Cannonball Jackman played. And they're like, there was Oops. a stadium, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yes, they've read about it, too. But we haven't done a great job of preserving it so that people can just go, oh, yeah, that stadium. Well, that was right over here. And they were ultimately able to find it. But I'm saying often people are like, I had no idea we had a team here. Exactly. Yeah. Donna, I'm going to email, I'm going to message apologies. you. I'm going to message you and we'll set up a Zoom later this week. I, we need to talk more. I want to go over to Gary Jolquin. Gary, how are you tonight? Oh, doing great. I've, I've got three questions. I'll get to them quickly. Uh, Bob, you may have already answered this one, but maybe I can reframe it and hopefully not contribute too much to this not being a video for children. Um, <laughs> When I encounter a place that fits my eye, and I'm not a professional photographer, I'm more of a point and shoot guy, I fall into what I call a photo orgy. I end up taking shots for two or three hours at a time, several hundred pictures. Are you always in this state? Or is there yes. a particular place in memory that is your favorite? That's question one, photo orgies. Two, 15,000 pictures in three weeks is a daunting number. Do you have My finger has arthritis now, so you know... <laughs> Do you have help? Do you have AI? Uh, What's yeah, your software, software platform? Well, my wife goes with me on a lot of the trips, but you know, we've worked it out because she doesn't want to, if, if there, nobody's playing, if I'm at, like uh, I went to, we went to Dartmouth up in uh, New Hampshire and she, she's, she's a almost semi-retired attorney now. And she spent the morning just, you know, taking it easy in the hotel, reading the paper, having her bagel and coffee and just relaxing what she wanted to do. And I had the carte blanche at Dartmouth. Of course, I was like a kid in a candy store. And, you know, I just shoot. I see stuff, boom, boom, boom. It comes in my mind, um, you know, uh, and you get privy to stuff when you when you you talk to the SIDs, sports information directors, and, and they introduce you to the coaches and strength people, the players and stuff. And you, you get a sense of what the place is like talking to the kids, you know. Uh, and uh, I just, I, I shoot like, uh, you know, uh, my favorite place to shoot, Outside of Fenway Park was probably Tiger Stadium in Detroit and Chicago Stadium, the old arena, loudest building I've ever been in. It, it was deafening um, because these places told a story. They they weren't fancy. And I preface this a lot when I talk to people. They were ballparks and arenas. You didn't have luxury boxes. Who cares? You're there to watch a game. You go to Tiger Stadium, you can smell the, the sausages from Hamtramck. You can smell the stale beer and the burnt cigars into the concrete. It was a ballpark. That was it. That Nothing more, nothing less. No luxury suites because, you know, we can't afford them anyways. And who cares about a luxury suite? I'm there to watch the game or photograph it and have a beer and a hot dog and enjoy myself, like along with most of the other people. Oh, that that reminds me, uh, Ted Williams hit one on the roof there years before I was born. And uh, I, I forget who it was that asked him as he was rounding the bases, what the hell have you been eating? <laughs> um, I, and if you have any other favorite Red Sox memories, I'm all ears, especially Ted Williams. Oh, um, I've never met Ted. I wish I could have. Uh, the, to How me, about Yaz? That was my childhood hero. Yeah, mm -hmm. you and me both, brother. Um, I met Yaz, and, and when I told the story in 77 when I was at Anaheim Stadium, 
And Yaz is a bit of aloof, as we all know. He he he's a lot like Ted. He doesn't like the media a lot, you know. But that's just Yaz. And I was with Fergie and everything, so it was a little more easier. And I saw Yaz at a couple of conventions, and he was he was very nice to me. We talked for a few minutes, and uh, you know, uh, the the only time I've ever been nervous, uh, I was excited when Gordy House sat next to me for breakfast with Fergie. But um, we were in Arlington. It was during the chase. It was after the chase and the, and the strike was was starting. And um, my wife and I were there and uh, we were some guy got us a tour, a private tour of the ballpark, <laughs> the clubhouse and everything. And the guy goes, here's a ticket stuff from the last game at uh, old Arlington Stadium, which was being demolished. And that was why I was there. Um, and he goes, Nolan Ryan is in the lobby right now. He's giving an interview. He'll sign it for you. My wife said. I've never seen you nervous and I've known you for a long time. You stammered and stuttered. And I'm like, it's Nolan freaking Ryan. I saw him pitch, you know, as a kid forever. And it, it was, it was, uh, you know, I, I stuttered something and his wife was there and Ruth was kind of smiling and laughing and my wife and her were kind of chuckling, but you know, um, it, again, it's, it's memories that you'll never forget. And one quick Fenway memory, um, in 2013, we took my 10-year-old nephew, then 10-year-old nephew, my sister-in-law, and my my mother-in-law, who was dying of cancer, and she wanted to see her son-in-law's photos in Cooperstown, and she wanted to see Fenway Park because she'd heard me talk about it. So I'm walking in with Louise. She's pretty frail, and you know we walk in uh, on the tour, and we're behind home plate. She grabs my arm, and she goes, this is so surreal. Now I know why you love this place, and it brought a tear to my eye. I said, yeah, now you know. Because Fenway Park, I know they've got the luxury. Of it's a ballpark. It's Fenway freaking park. You know, you, you know, they tore down a living museum in New York, Yankee Stadium, and they built the mall park. It's not the same. I'm sorry. Um, even though I do not like the Yankees, it's Yankee Stadium. It's like the old Montreal Forum in Montreal. These are shrines that should still be standing. The forum is, but it's a movie theater now. But, um, you know, it, it really irritated me when they tore down Yankee Stadium. You know, well, one, I one last thought. To... Oh, Can I get, I just want to interject one last closing thought. Uh, before I moved to the West Coast, I made a pilgrimage to a Marriott in Boston for a signing with Yastrzemski. Uh, the only time I've ever met him. And uh, uh, it was also the only moment in which I ever saw a person get a standing ovation for taking a bathroom break. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> I like that. I am going to go to Dick Layton, who is here tonight. Dick, how are you feeling, my friend? I'm trying to, I'm sorry, you had to <laughs> mute me. Uh, I'm I'm in my second week of getting over another attack of COVID, so. Oh, fuck. Hey. You got to stop that, man. Come on. I know. Hey, I'm, I'm immune compromised, unfortunately. Uh, but, yeah. So, I mean, what? yeah. So, I, I, you know, I, I could try. I, so many of the your your comments have tweaked and, and interest, but there's something I I, I really want to know I, from you, a West Coast person. I, where were you in 1989? Were you assigned to the World Series? No, actually, in 1989, I was um, trying to find myself. Believe it or not, I was like 29 years, 30 years old, and. Uh, let me preface this. I won't go into detail, but I did not have a great home life as a kid. I was the youngest and I was, it, it's a long story, but my parents, my mom was from New England and she didn't know how to handle an artist, which a photographer is. And I had no desire to be involved in, you know, uh, business or any of that crap. I just didn't want to do it. And I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something with the stadiums and photography. And I was living in Dallas, Texas at the time, and we were watching the World Series and I'm like, son of a gun. Uh, I use other words, um, you know, and I'm, I'm seeing San Francisco and I know I've been to San Francisco hundreds of times and I'm seeing all these landmarks, the, the Bay Bridges collapse. And I'm like, wow, you know, it, it just it freaked me out because, uh, you know, I've been to Candlestick many times and, you know, to see all the people on, uh, on the uh, field and hear them talking and the light standards are doing this. And I'm like, whoa, that's an earthquake. You know, I've lived through many earthquakes. That was a big one. And um, if you haven't lived through an earthquake, take a plate of jello and shake it really good. And that's what it's like. <laughs> it's doing this. 
Uh, you know, you're like, whoa. And I mean, it's like, man, I had way too much to drink. I need to put the bottle down. But it, it's a scary feeling, you know. Um, and uh, I was in Dallas, Texas. I wasn't at the World Series, but uh, I was watching it. I was, I was hoping you were sitting next to Al Michaels trying to deal with uh, something which wasn't orchestrated like a baseball game and trying to you know, make it relevant to the people who are listening to him. <laughs> Well, that was like like I was explaining when I was in the press box at uh, uh, the the new ballpark in Arlington before this new one they they just opened up and we're watching the OJ chase and people are asking me questions and I'm like giving play by play of OJ <laughs> going down the 405 freeway you know I mean uh, yeah there's the donut place and you know and and it's just all the landmarks kept popping up and I'm like yeah 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 I know that 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 and they said what do you think they're heading I said they're heading to his house in the west side of LA in Santa Monica. And uh, boom, that's where they ended up. It was, was in that earthquake. What's that? So, so Bruce, do I get one other question because he wasn't there next to Al Michaels? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Dick, what do you got? I, I, I wondered if you have any curiosity about um, the ballparks that were used during the dead ball era. And I'm talking about parks that were built and used uh, between the Civil War and the First World War, uh, yes, especially absolutely. up here in New England. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking with Donna about the Negro Leagues, and absolutely I'm interested in the dead ball era. Um, I, you know, um, Bracefield came along in what, 19, was it 1914, I think they built it, that's when it opened. And, you know, that was just after the dead ball era and Fenway Park the same way. But I'm, you know, uh, the Huntington Avenue grounds and places like that. I've been there where it's at Northeastern. You know, they've got a little plaque there with Cy Young and everything. Um, those, they, those places fascinate me because I'm thinking I'm standing on the same ground Cy Young stood on, you know, and, and some of these Wee Willie Keeler and all these early players. I'm saying they played here. You know, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. And I, I want to do more. <laughs> more research and history on that and and it, it you know the dead ball era um there's not a lot there's i don't think there's any parts left from the dead ball era i don't believe i mean well, be yeah oh how about centennial field here in burlington vermont oh you're in burlington yes i've been there yes. been there my okay. uh, a well, friend of mine fun. is a my friend of mine is a professor from high school. He and I went to high school together. He's a mathematics professor at UVM so I've been up to Burlington several times. And I'm also referring to the number of fairgrounds in the North Country where the ballpark was in the infield. And some of those those fairgrounds are still here. There's one in Rutland, Vermont. There's one in Malone. And you can actually see the, the ball, and especially in Rutland, uh, the ballpark where Babe Ruth hit the longest home run that they'd ever seen in Vermont. Uh, can, you do, can you do me a favor? Um, sure. Have Bruce... Uh, give you my email uh, and email me. I'd love to keep in contact because I want to I want to delve into this a little more. And that brings me to a, a, another story. There's a ballpark up here in Northern California in a little town called Dunsmere. I mean, it, it, you, you fart and you're through the town. I mean, it's that small, but it's right on the Sacramento River. It's in the Siskiyou Mountains. And um, there's they still have the ballpark there. And there's a plaque where Bob Musil and Babe Ruth did a barnstorming thing there. And Babe Ruth had the longest home run anybody had ever seen. They couldn't find the ball. They said they hit it in the Sacramento River, which was quite a poke from where the <laughs> ballpark is. And I'm thinking only Babe Ruth could do that. But there, there's a the letter there. And, you know, he he pretty much, they pretty much turned Dunsmere on their ear because it, it was an old mining town, you know, an old railroad town. And there's maybe... 300 people in the town now and I've been to that little ballpark and it's on my website it's you know it's a piece of Americana these little like you said these old um uh dead ball era ballparks you know I'm glad I you know Centennial Field is awesome I love it I love it it's a great ballpark and you're lucky to live in Burlington <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh Karen Holler did you have something let's get you unmuted here yeah, I apologize for that. Uh, my question was, I'm from Pittsburgh. So I'm wondering about you photographing Forbes Field, Three Rivers Stadium, uh, PNC. And have you known a lot? I mean, has 
that what's what's gone around with you when you go to Pittsburgh? I photographed PNC and I photographed Three Rivers and I've been to the site. I have I never saw Forbes Field standing. But oh. again, you know, I photographed the wall where, where Maz hit the home run. They've got the marker and everything. And that again, you know, it, it the memory slashed back. I've been to Posver Hall where the home plate is encased in 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 the ground where home plate was. And mm -hmm. you know, you can picture it in, like me, if you're like me, you can picture Forbes Field standing there. You know, it was a great old park. And of course, you know, um, Babe Ruth's last home run was one of the longest ever hit in Forest Field, typical Babe Ruth. Um, but, you know, it, and, and it was like the old ballparks in, um, you know, at Fenway Park, Wrigley Field. They were they were nestled in, in neighborhoods. You know, Connie Mack Stadium was in a neighborhood, although you don't want to go to North Philly right now. It's not the greatest <laughs> neighborhood in the world. Um, but Forbes Field, as you know, was in Oakland, in the Oakland section. Yeah. It was in the neighborhood, you know, they they had houses across the street, you know, um, Wrigley Field is the same way. Comiskey Park was like that a little bit. If you go into the railroad bridge, there were all the houses. And uh, if you went across the freeway, which you didn't want to do, there was the uh, the apartment, the uh, housing projects where you really didn't want to go. They're gone now. But, you know, all the old ballpark, Yankee Stadium was a neighborhood in the Bronx. You know, the polo grounds, Ebbets Field, they're all in neighborhoods. You know, and once um, Baltimore started going back to the inner city, you know, with uh, Camden Yards and San Diego did it and San Francisco has done it and all these teams are doing it, uh, it's, it, it revitalizes the inner city where these, these ballparks are. Because, um, for example, um, where they built um, uh, the Giants ballpark, um, they've changed names so many times. Uh, it, nobody went to China Basin. and it was all boarded up warehouses. Now, across from the ballpark are multi-million dollar townhouse. You know, so a, a good ballpark is going to really juice up the economy. Same thing with Petco in San Diego. My my wife is from San Diego. My father-in-law used to tell me, he said, Bob, nobody went where Petco is now. When you Before, you didn't go there. It was a bunch of uh, homeless people and drug addicts and boarded up warehouses. Now, they've got million dollar condos by the ballpark. So it... You know, I'm glad they're going back to the inner city a little bit. It brings back, it revitalizes an area, you know. And, um, you know, of course, where uh, PNC Park is now, they've got, uh, you know, they got, uh, I still wish they would have called it Heinz Field. But um, they've got the football stadium and they've got a marker where um, their original ballpark was, uh, where the Pirates played. Um, it, it, mm -hmm. It's right in between uh, where, where um, Three Rivers was and where PNC is now. The oh. recreation park, I think it was, if I'm if I recall correctly. But yeah, um, I never. I wish I could have seen Forbes. I, I that was that's another one that was on my list. And I've had ball players. I when I talk to ball players, older ball players, Billy Williams, Fergie, guys like that, I always ask them about the old ballparks because I want to find out as much as I can. You know, what were the clubhouses like? And usually, I won't repeat what they were telling me, but they were small. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things that I've heard here tonight is the, about photography, expanding our connection to the past, expanding our connection to each other, expanding our connection to baseball or whatever sport is our favorite. And it's something I never really thought of that you could use this media to connect and get even more intimately involved or intimately raise your fandom for lack of a better term. I don't have a, have the, the vernacular for it. And that's kind of a revelation to me, mainly because I can't take a photograph even with my, my, my phone, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> Donna was shaking her head. Yes. As I was, uh, as I mentioned that, I think Donna uh, would um, agree that um Raising that bar for connection is one of the things that photography can do for us. Absolutely, it can. Because a lot of these teams, a lot of the major league teams, they kind of push their past to the side. They don't want to hear about it. They, a lot of the Dodgers don't want to hear about Brooklyn. The, the LA Dodgers, they, they, it's like, yeah, we, we recognize it, but. And there's only a few Brooklyn Dodgers left. Sandy's one of them. And uh, Carl Erskine, and I think there's one or two more. 
Um, but, you know, there's not many, you know, they left Brooklyn, what, uh, you know, 65 exactly. years ago. Yeah. So, so um, you know, they, they, and that, that, that's what bothers me a lot about Major League Baseball is they don't want any of their past. Like, you don't see much of uh, Yankee State, old Yankee Stadium's past. Yes, they've got the garden across the street where the stadium was and all that stuff. And, you know, as, as a sports historian, it, it bothers me that it's there. They, I should still see Yankee Stadium sitting there, you know. And, but uh, they, a lot of these teams, like the Tigers really don't go, they have statues in the outfield of all their Tiger greats, but they don't incorporate old Tiger Stadium into the new ballpark. And that bothers me because Tiger Stadium, uh, for one, was, was one of the greatest ballparks ever built. You know, Comiskey Park, yeah, it had the posts, it had bad sight lines, but if you ask a fan now, they'd rather go see a game at Old Comiskey than uh, um, Guaranteed Great Field or whatever the flavor of the month is this year, you know, um, because it had that intimate setting. It was a ballpark, nothing more. Like I said before, nothing less. It was a ballpark. You got your hot dog, you knew the vendors, they knew you. Uh, you could go by Nancy Faust, who was playing the organ, and say hi. She would say hi back because it was an open booth. And now everybody's segregated. You know, they're all pushed away. Um, and it, it, baseball is a great sport, but it's lost a lot um, to me with with its past. It's more about the future, and and we could get into a whole new can of worms with uh, you know uh, metrics and all that other garbage. But you know, baseball is a very classic, timeless game. It's it's very it's a very simple game. You throw the ball, catch the ball, you hit the ball feel the ball it, that's that's the whole thing um i wish more teams would look back at their past you know um i, I like the pirates could do something more with forbes field forbes field is a great old ballpark you know um wrigley you know i'm glad they redid wrigley i'm glad they redid um uh fenway to, to where it is where they've got the um you know they've got the monster seats which are awesome to sit in by the way and um I'll give you a quick Wrigley story. So Fergie was a pitching coach for the Cubbies. And this was late in the season, 94 or 95, I can't remember. Um, and, I, you know, he gets, he helped, gets me my media credentials for a weekend. And I'm like, I'm like a kid in a candy store. And I, Fergie and I go have breakfast. He goes, Bobby, I got to go get dressed. I'm going to the clubhouse. I said, okay. So I'm walking around and I'm in the outfield and I'm touching the wall. I'm touching the ivy and I'm thinking, my friends are going to die if they know where I am right now. You know, and I hear this whistle. And I look and it's it's Billy Williams and Fergie in the dugout and they call me and I go running in and Billy goes, man, you look like a kid in a candy store, dude. And I said, Billy, my friends would give their eye teeth to be where I am right now. So I said, Billy, tell me about Sandy's perfect game, Koufax's perfect game against the Cubs where Bob Henley threw a one hitter. He goes, let me tell you something. Becker came up, he was second up and he goes, um, he comes back to the dugout and he goes, Sandy doesn't have bleep tonight. We're going to get him. Billy comes up and Billy's poking me in the chest by this time. And he goes, let me tell you something. That SOB was throwing so hard. I go, we ain't getting bleak tonight. He said he was throwing so hard his cap kept flying off. which never happened with Sandy. And he said he struck out the last six guys with no problem. He goes, I've never seen anything like it. He said, we couldn't have hit him in a week. It, he was, it, it, But again, that's the, that's the kind of stuff you get from talking to players. And, you know, um, I wish they would do more to honor the older ballparks and arenas that are gone. You know, uh, I know um, PD North garden does a little bit. They have Boston garden seats there and they do a little bit of an honor of the old Boston garden, which as we know is right next to it. Um, you know, these, these places are only left in our memories and photos now, and we can't let them die. We've got to keep them going. And like Donna said, with the Negro leagues and uh, you know, with the uh, old dead ball era stadiums that are still around, um, we got to keep them going and we got to, we've got to keep the history going. And that's what I'm trying to do, you know, uh, because there's so much history to not just the ballpark, but who played there, you know, like, uh, you know, um, like, a, like I was saying, um, Josh Gibson played at Forest Field in Pittsburgh, you know, hit some of the longest home runs ever seen. And the records are very shady because it was the Negro leagues, which, you know, was a travesty to uh, uh, to baseball. You know, it took so long to have Negro ball players that were a lot better than some of the white players. You know, I mean, look at it; it's history. You know, and I, and that's what I'm trying to do.
That's fantastic stuff. It's uh, I I I can't get over the revelation of connection with with photography, and I really appreciate you you talking about that tonight. And as we move forward, we're actually going to be speaking with another photographer next week, Monday, November thirteenth, seven p.m. Eastern time. My good friend, who's here on our call this evening, and same remember. Donna Muscarella, a fourth generation baseball enthusiast and visual artist whose work includes photography and mixed media projects. She's gonna be with us leading a discussion on the first national historic landmark that honors baseball, Hinchcliffe Stadium. This pre presentation is a highly anticipated meeting and I hope that everyone is going to join us. Donna, do you have any uh, thing you would like to discuss hear real quick about your presentation. You want to give us a little preview? Sure. Um, so I'm going to run through the history of the ballpark um, and talk about some milestone things that have happened there. Um, I'm going to tell the story through some of my photography, um, some photography that I got from Friends of Hinchliffe Stadium from back when it was actually in use. Um, and we'll talk about the some uh, before and after shots of how bad it was to what it is now and the history and um, the, the names that played there will blow your mind. So tune in. I look forward to talking about it and, and taking your questions and sharing my photography and making connections. Donna, I look forward to seeing that. And I will be here next week to see that. And um, uh, I want to get your email address so we can keep in touch. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll get it through Bruce. I'll get it through okay. Bruce. That's perfect. All right, let's get everybody out of here so they can uh, go put their feet up for a little while this evening. I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. Bob Busser, you are awesome. Thank you thank very you. much for doing this this evening. I really appreciate it. I'll be talking to you offline at some point. We'll see Donna next week. We hope we can see everybody here again, 7 o'clock, November 13th. See you then. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much.